Hi, I'm Noel for the chance to speak here today. Uh, my name is Robert Ramsey. I'm a senior optical engineer at Medlock Optics. And I kind of want to introduce a new device that will be hitting the market pretty soon that uh, will come out with some IP out of Kent State uh, that utilizes a polymer stabilized network for uh, fast pneumatic liquid crystal devices. Uh, first off, I'm going to talk about my large optics. I'll do a little commercial for our company. Uh, then I'm going to talk quite a bit about the actual technology that we're going to be using, uh, the Palmer Network LCs. And then I'll talk about the devices that will be released uh, in what we're going to term swift liquid crystal devices. So Metalark has had a long tradition of LC components. Uh, we offer different varieties of liquid crystal variable retarders, uh, compensated and uncompensated. We offer variable attenuators, polarization rotators, and these are all based upon uh, bulk pneumatic LC devices. Uh, we also have LC controllers, uh, we have standalone controllers, as well as uh, four channel computer interface controllers for thermal temperature uh, control in the system. We also sell transmission mode spatial light modulators, uh, either hexagonal pixels or we also have uh, rectangular pixels. We sell tunable optical filters, which are based upon liquid crystal technology. Uh, we sell visible range, near infrared, and we also do custom filters. Uh, here's a nice little picture of one of our VIS tunable filters as we sweep through the VIS spectrum. You can look through and see the transmission of the different colors. We also sell polarimeters. Uh, based systems, which are liquid crystal based technology uh, for both the visible and near infrared. So let's talk about pneumatic LCs and uh, speed, basically. Uh, so the thrust of uh, the current SLM market is speed. Uh, so we decided to take it upon ourselves to get some IP and develop a technology to where we could have a ultra fast transmission mode special line modulator based on pneumatic LCs. So there's been several efforts to speed up LC devices in terms of uh, just bulk pneumatic liquid crystal. Uh, several uh, efforts in terms of optimization of LC materials, elastic constants, changing by refrigerant, rotational viscosities. There's also been several efforts uh, in making thin cell gap material uh, devices for high speed uh, because the response time is proportional to the square of the thickness of the cell. Uh, so if you get a thick cell, uh, your response time slows down quite a bit uh, in terms of relaxation times especially. Uh, there's been modes of operations developed high cells. There's been modified driving schemes uh, transient pneumatic effect or frequency LCs. All these uh, attempts at fast switching systems are not practical for sub-millisecond device operation along with large optical phase modulations that you need for, say, infrared uh, technologies. So along comes the sheer LC technology that was developed at Kent State. So there was a critical need to decouple this LC film thickness from the switching speeds. Uh, we needed large amounts of stroke, which require a thick cell gap, but we needed them to respond faster. Uh, it had been confirmed quite a bit in terms of polymer materials that the electro-optical properties uh, of LCs confined in small materials were quite interesting. Uh, one of those were fast switching speeds. So there were a couple of technologies that come out of this uh, work here. Polymer dispersed liquid crystals, uh, polymer network liquid crystals. Uh, they switch faster due to the assistance of the polymer matrix uh, owing its uh, restore of anchoring forces. So the relaxation times are much better than just bulk LCs. A couple of drawbacks, PDLCs showed uh, very low phase modulation uh, as you went through the bulk of the material. Polymer pneumatic LCs have high operating fields as well as they scatter line. So this operation is going to be limited by polymer pneumatic LCs. So during the search 
for an ideal fast switching large phase modulation material. Uh, John West and his group at Kent State developed a technology called shear liquid crystal uh, polymer composites. Basically, after photopolymerization of a typical polymer network LC, they took the cell and they sheared it. And during the shear process, they got bulk alignment of the LCs. And a typical PDLC or PMLC, you don't get alignment in the bulk. You can align along the surface, but you can't get alignment throughout the bulk of the material because the polymer breaks that uh, range of alignment. The shear devices they found become scatter free and could modulate large phase retardations at fast speeds. Uh, when I say large phase retardations, uh, several microns worth of phase retardation. Uh, these devices essentially decouple the switching speed uh, from the liquid crystal film thickness. So we could have thick films with high speed and large phase modulation. Uh, soon after this was developed, uh, Metal Arc Optics retained the uh, intellectual property rights of this material and it was set forth in development. So let's take a look at a little cartoon of what uh, this sheer technology is. Uh, Scott yesterday from Besson Technologies, um, Besson Optics, talked about this, how the surface layer of a typical LC is where your high speed region is, and the bulk is quite low. Uh, low speed material. So, one thing we could do to get high speed material is just stack a bunch of thin cell gap there. We could get quite high speed. Problem is, cell gap control, uh, a couple of hundred nanometer cell gap is kind of hard to hit with uh, spatial balls. Optical loss for the multiple reflections, and the voltage driving scheme would be quite complicated to get a lot of stroke out of a device like this. So the West group thought, well, maybe we can use polymer networks. And the polymer network basically would just sit in here in the bulk of the material. The problem with the polymer network, LC, is there's no alignment in the bulk, like I said. The polymer's there uh, to allow surface angling forces or storm forces, but there's no alignment of the LC. So you just get quite a bit of scatter. So what they did was say, let's shear the guy and let's get alignment in the bulk. And that's what happened. So as you shear this guy, several microns, hundreds of microns in our case, you can get alignment of the LC in the bulk. So although this process was the holy grail for phase modulation devices, there were several technological challenges that had to be developed at Metal Art before we could infiltrate the market with a device. Uh, one was the optimization of the material set uh, for use across a broad thermal range. Reliable and repeatable fabrication, mechanical durability during and after the shear process, uh, uniformity of phase retardation across clear apertures up to three inches, uh, high spectral transmission in the vids, and this was quite a challenge because of the scatter uh, even in a shear polymer below 500, you get a little bit of scatter. Uh, we wanted high speed, but we didn't want 600 volts to kick the thing around, so we wanted to limit ourselves to below 100 volts, but we wanted some high speed out of that. And during the sweep of a variable retarder, you want uniform phase across the material as you're going through voltages. Uh, so that was also a challenge. Thermal, separable contrast ratios, transmitter wavefront had to be good, uh, quite a few things. So we took it upon ourselves to go after this challenge. So the first thing we looked at was the materials uh, aspect of it. Uh, we utilized a Merck's E-Series, uh, E7, E63, E44. Uh, these are somewhat stable across a broad uh, temperature range. Uh, the polymer uh, stabilizing material that's utilized in stress LCs are the Norlin optical adhesives. Uh, as well as acrylate monomers, uh, diacrylates from Dynamax. Uh, some other components that were utilized in the development process was uh, diacrylate mesogens. Uh, of course, when you throw a diacrylate in there, we had to have some fluid initiators. Uh, we also used surfactants um, to uh, do some nice things with lower voltages. 
And we also use oxygen scavengers whenever we use aggregate monomers, chain extenders, uh, such as MVP. So the morphology and the electro optical characteristics of these LCs were greatly influenced uh, by the material set as well as the cure process, which, which is quite laborious, as well as the cure intensities and the stuff and the like. So let's talk quickly about the fabrication process of a stress belt, a shear LC device. Uh, it uses an isotrop fill technique, which is basically an isotropic drop fill between two glass sides coated with indium tin oxide. Nice thing about stressed LCs is I don't have to spin code on a polyimid layer and buff it. Uh, there's no line of layers on these devices. Uh, so the isotropic UV cure in the first stage cures for an extended duration and an elevated temperature of the isotropic of the liquid crystal. So we hit this guy with UV and we start to get a polymer network forming. Uh, and after an extended duration of uh, UV, uh, we end up getting uh, quite an extensive network of polymer achieved after the first cure. So this is done again at elevated temperatures. We take this guy from elevated temperatures to room temperature, and we end up getting uh, the LC to start phase segregating out of the polymer network. So we have the LC droplets here that are in the line. The second stage of the process is basically just a flood lid cure on the cell to get rid of any polymerizations or polymers that were residual. So here's one of our cells. This is a one inch cell here. And after cure, this is again a polymer network LC. So you can see quite a bit of scattering in the system. So what we do is we take this cell and we shear it. Now the shear distance controls both the retardation as well as the switching times of the device. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to play a little video of myself grabbing this device across cross polars, and as I shear it, you can see us going through several nanometers of, of phase retardation. Uh, so you can see I go in, I squeeze the guy, I start down here, so my shear distance increases, and the retardation through the cross polars uh, reaches approximately 600 nanometers across the cell. So once we get to some retardation we want, we block that guy in. Uh, we can also do rounds if we feel so desired. So here's a, one of our round optics, one inch round, and I'm shearing it. Uh, the process we use to shear is obviously a little more elaborate than fingers, but this is a nice little video of the process. So the spectral transmission also, you saw that this was quite cloudy in, in the vids. The shear process will also increase the spectral transmission. Uh, it appears hazy at first, and then as I push on it, you can see the haze go away as I shear this guy. It clears up quite readily. And the round here, if you look at the black, you can see the haze. And then as you push on it, the LCs align, you get less scatter uh, in the system. So here's a spectral scan on our typical FIS part that's going to be released. Uh, the black line is the transmission of the unsheared device, and as we shear it, uh, the transmission bumps up. These are uncoated glass slides, um, and you can see the axes are basically the theoretical transmission of this, the optical path that we're using for this device. So there's still a little bit of scatter in the blue, uh, about 10% scatter uh, from the theoretical uh, transmission of the glass. And across the IR, the device basically is transparent, um, averaging about 90%. Uh, again, here's the unsheared and the sheared state in the system. So we've got ourselves a nice uniform retardation cell uh, with LC that we can control with external fields. So how fast does this guy switch for us? The switching speeds, again, increase as a function of shear distance. So I can shear this thing to where it almost pops apart and we can get a quite rapid response, well below 50 microseconds. But we don't want to destroy the part of fabrication. Uh, so this is our typical cell here that's been sheared. Uh, what this is, is 670 nanometer uh, laser diode going through cross polars uh, and we induce uh, half-wave retardation. 
This is the on time, 68 microseconds, and the decay time, uh, which is a complete adiabatic decay. There's no field to kick it down, so this is from, say, 25 volts to zero volts. The decay is actually 128 microseconds, which is quite astounding for a pneumatic LC. Uh, the available stroke, uh, available transmission profile in our cells. Uh, so as you apply the voltage across the cell, Again, this is a 670 nanometer uh, wavelength, and we're looking at the transmission. And you can see out here there would be zero retardation, and as you go up, you go to half wave, and then you go down to almost full wave. So a single part, about 600 nanometers of retardation. So it's close to a full wave at 670. We can take that data and turn it into a basic drive response of the cell in terms of retardation. Uh, so as you drive the cell, it starts out with so much retardation and it can go down to basically uh, the residual uh, retardation in the cell, which again, this is uncompensated. Compensated, we drop that down to zero with a compensator. The drive response is actually linear uh, in, a, in a large region uh, over this voltage and it contains no hysteresis uh, in the cell also, which is nice. So what are we offering in this? Uh, that might be of interest to some of you. Uh, we're going to offer basically the same line that we do now, barrel retarders, attenuators, and high-speed non-mechanical shutters. Uh, so we're going to have computer control of the device, temp control option, as well as sub only second response time in our devices. So the other thing of interest to the group I've noticed over the past few days are uh, spatial light modulators, adaptive optics. Uh, currently, right now, we're researching uh, low operating voltage uh, Swift LC technology uh, for, for true wavefront adaptive optics with response times less than 100 microseconds both ways. Uh, we plan on uh, developing SLMs, transmission mode SLMs, uh, with this pixel array up to 256 pixels, uh, which here's a Here's our normal TN uh, SLM uh, picture here. It's computer controlled. Uh, we'll just replace the local material with this uh, Swift LC. Um, that's it. Questions? So these things are sheared, and obviously you have to lock the shear in. 
uh, with some sort of perimeter sealant. Uh, and that material has been tested quite extensively uh, because one of the drawbacks is, is you get a release in the shear. Uh, but we've done quite a bit of testing on that. But as far as AD and the ball come out, I don't have any data on that. Again, it's a slightly different device, but have you considered looking at ferro entries? It's a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, have we looked in utilizing this technology with FLC materials? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, there's a the reason why I asked the question. Uh, no. Okay, you can you can form fast shear PDLCs in ferrometrics, and then you get really fast times. It might be of interest to you. On the order of, geez, you can go down to tens of microseconds. Okay. We, we, we did it about five, six, seven years ago. Okay. We did shear rate. Okay. Uh, John Lewis and other work, but it might be. Are these possible. all same lines? Yeah. Polymer same lines. And the axioms of the chief form tubules in the uh, system. Right. And then we might be of great interest to get some applications. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Is this the solar first of the same of When you change LC, obviously you're going to change everything. Yeah, you'll be able to get the same result with other E series? Uh, I can tell you that obviously if you go from E7 to E44, you're going to have a higher fiber fringes. So you're going to have a lot more stroke with a fixed cell gap. Uh, 5CB is not good for products. Yeah. <laughs> I can kind of warm it up and then with my hand. Uh, so we tried to choose some stable LCs that are commercially available for us to, to manufacture these devices. But it's also to show that all these devices are It belongs to this to the this part that we're going to produce. Uh, I, I'd rather, kind of proprietary, I'd rather not say. We've done quite a bit of development by just going from 5CB to the E-Series. No, no, they, these are pure uh, E series LCs, no 5 CB. Okay. And also, of course, e, e, you know, the E series has 5 CB in it, but these are just bought off the shelf from Merck. And also, that risk couldn't have a lot of things, some environmental work, um, how the temperature affects the situation, maybe actually use therapies for the lifetime of this. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Well, I have a question. I have the observation as a mission that in short being light, the throughput of the new body as a law, you can't have any way to increase the throughput of the short being light. Say that again? In short being light. The short wavelengths it falls off, is that what you're here? Yeah. You, what are you asking? Then the theoretical? Yeah, that, this this here is this roll off below five hundred is typical of polymer L C composite materials. This is just in the index mismatch, scatter. This is just scattering the polymer network L C. It's, it, it's very hard to get rid of this unless you change the domain size. Uh, and when you go to a nano domain size, your, your fields are unbelievably high. So, so, so there's a trade-off. I 
I guess I don't understand the question. The new provider, for example, we want to use the DLLC to do some division device. Yes. We very careful about the new provider. So, the calling of you, the calling of you there, very good, very good. I have to call the new provider to get the location. So, the wait for the error, the transit is the wait for the error. Yeah, the phone line. In the blue. Is that what you're, transmitter wave front in the blue? Is it, we're getting, the transmitter wave front on these parts are between half wave and quarter wave at 633. Okay, the, well, we, we fought the wave front battle too on several, the transmitter wave front was a bear to fight too. Uh, and it didn't have anything to do with the scattering uh, in the system. Thank you.